All right, um, let's go ahead and get started here. Are there any questions, any problems anybody has um, an interest in discussing? Okay, so um, yesterday we introduced Avogadro's number and we looked at the idea that Avogadro's number is connected to the mole, right? So what we said was there was this number, this large number, uh, the Avogadro number. And it's a really large number, 10 to the 23rd. Okay, and that is equal to one mole of whatever substance you're talking about. It could be atoms or molecules or electrons or photons, protons, anything you want to talk about. Okay, and what we want to do now is something very, very practical. What we want to do is we want to connect this relationship to mass. We want to connect it to mass. And the reason that that's useful, and it is really useful, is that mass is essentially how we measure um, almost everything in chemistry to some extent is about measuring mass because it's so darn easy. We can measure mass so easily. If you think about it, you can buy a, a, a scale for your kitchen or a, a scale for your bathroom pretty cheaply. And they're pretty good, actually. At least some of them are pretty good. And so in a chemistry laboratory, we can spend $1,000 and have something that's able to measure out the mass of something to 0 0.0001 grams accuracy. And um, that's pretty impressive. And there are devices that actually measure mass out to you know, billionths of a gram. You can buy those as well. They're very expensive, but, but they exist. So we can measure mass really well. So if we have a way of measuring mass really well and we can connect it to this Avogadro number or to the mole, then that gives us a way of counting things. It allows us to count atoms and molecules. So for example, suppose I said the following, suppose I said that you got these rocks and they all have the same weight. So you say like, you know, each rock weighs 500 pounds, right? So each rock weighs 500 pounds. If I then said the following, I'm gonna say, hey, you know what? I've got this big bundle of rocks. There's a huge amount of them. Okay. And I say, hey, this big bundle of rocks weighs 50,000 pounds. Okay. So I weighed them all together and it's 50,000 pounds. What I could do with that number is I could figure out how many rocks are in there. What I would do is I would say, look, the whole thing weighs 50,000 pounds. And each rock, one rock is 500 pounds. So pounds cancel, you would get a ratio, what is that, 100? So you get 100 rocks. Now, if the rocks, if they're naturally occurring rocks, that wouldn't work because naturally occurring rocks don't have the same weight. But if they were bricks, if they were giant bricks that someone made in a, in a factory, then that would be pretty close, right? They would be pretty close to the same weight. And the thing about atoms is that atoms do weigh the same. So for example, one oxygen atom, you know, has a weight that's pretty much the same as the next oxygen atom. Okay, so what we can do then is we can say the following, we're gonna weigh something, we're gonna measure its mass and then we're going to use that to count how many atoms or how many molecules of that substance there is. But we need something to connect that together. Here, it was this right here. 
we knew that one rock weighs 500 pounds. So we need something to connect mass and counting atoms and molecules as well. And what that is, is the atomic mass, if we're dealing with atoms, and the molar mass, if we're dealing with molecules. And those come from the periodic table. So those have all been worked out. People have done the, the work on this to figure out what those numbers are. So just like I would say that one rock weighs 500 pounds, I would say one hydrogen atom weighs 1.01 uh, AMU. However, that's only one atom. And generally we're dealing with large numbers of atoms, not one atom or 10 atoms or a thousand atoms. We have huge numbers of atoms. The number of hydrogen atoms in the, in the human body is like 10 to the 25th. That's a lot of atoms, 10 to the 26th. And so, so we're, you know, what, how are we gonna deal with that? We're gonna deal with it this way. We're gonna use this relationship right here because this is what we use to deal with large numbers. If we have a large number of atoms or molecules, we use the mole as a unit. So let me show you how we go about that. It's pretty straightforward. What we do is we say, look, you've got these numbers here that have already been worked out in the periodic table. So hydrogen is 1.01. .01. Lithium is 6.94. And we got some all the way over here, right? Like, so for example, you got nitrogen. Well, let's do carbon first. Carbon's such a common element. 12.01. Nitrogen. 14.01. Oxygen. 16. All right, I'll just do those for right now. Okay, so what we could do is we could say the following. Suppose we have... Um, 52, I'm just making up a number, 52.10 grams of carbon. It's a bunch of carbon atoms. We're going to ask two questions. So first one is, how many moles is this? And then the second question is, how many atoms is this? And then once we've done this, I'll, I'll get into the Alex problems, just so you can sort of see what your homework sounds like. Okay, so here's how you go about it. We're talking about carbon. So you go to the periodic table and you look up carbon right there. The number you want to use is the one at the bottom there, the 12.01. .01. That is referred to as either the atomic mass, but it's also, it actually has two meanings. The atomic mass is how much one atom weighs in the units of AMU. So we would say for carbon, it's 12.01 AMU. But here's one thing that can be kind of confusing. It has a second meaning too. And the second meaning is called the molar mass. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, it sounds like molecular mass, which we talked about um, yesterday, day before. Uh, the, the molar mass is the mass of one mole of a substance right? Molar meaning per mole. So I'm going to write it down here. The molar mass for carbon is that number right there again. So it has two meanings. It's the atomic mass, but it's also the molar mass. And here's the difference. This is the mass of one atom, the atomic mass, and it's in the units of AMU. In when we're referring to molar mass, it's in the units of grams. G per mole. So I'm gonna write one mole. So this, remember, this is grams, this is the unit of mass. So think about like a, a, a pen. A pen weighs about five grams, five to 10 grams. So a gram, so carbon, 12 grams. So like twice the weight of this pen or you know, one and a half times the weight of this pen. So what that means is if you have, remember the mole is this large number, 6.022. If you have that many atoms, that large number of atoms, that's a mole. So carbon 
has a mass of 12.01 AMU if it's just one atom. An AMU is a tiny amount of mass. But if you have this large number of atoms, it's the molar mass, it's this large number, not any large number, but this large number. If you have that many, you can use the same number and that's per mole, okay? So imagine you've got all these large number of atoms of carbon, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's one mole, that's what a mole is, it's that. If you have that many, you now know, you now know how much it weighs, 12.01 grams, okay? So that ends up being very practical for us. It's relatively rare that we ever want to weigh out the mass of one atom or two atoms. I mean, it happens. There are chemists that do that kind of work. But more likely, we have like a little pill, like some aspirin or some ibuprofen, some sort of medication. In that, there's going to be a large number of atoms a large number of molecules. So here, this ends up being more practical for us. How many grams does something weigh? And so this ends up being a large, uh, uh, an easy way to count things. So in general, once you've done that introductory problem on Avogadro's number, you're not gonna really use it very often. You're gonna more likely be doing problems that involve grams and moles. So. If I have this many grams, how many moles is that? If I have this many moles, how many grams is that? So let me show you this problem. Oops, I don't want to do that. I just want to erase some stuff. I'm going to show you this problem, and you'll see that it's pretty much like most of the homework problems. And then I'll take a look at an actual homework problem so you can see how they're similar. Okay, so here's how you go about it. What we're given is that you got 52.10 grams of carbon. So notice the way that I'm writing this out. I'm doing this to be kind of organized in terms of my problem solving, just like you would in a math problem. I'm writing out the information they gave us and I'm indicating what material I'm talking about. And I'm doing that extra step just so that I know what I'm calculating as I go through here. And then I'm gonna look at the question. The question is how many moles is this? So we wanna know what moles is. Here's the relationship. That number right there, the molar mass, is in the units of grams. So 12.01 grams. That's how much one mole weighs. So see what I wrote there? 12.01 grams is how much one mole of carbon weighs. And you're going to use this as your conversion factor. So just like I said, one rock weighs 500 grams. And by knowing how much one rock weighs, that tells me how many rocks we have. You're gonna use this molar mass as your conversion factor. So here's how you use the conversion factor. You say, what's the question? The question is how many moles? So we wanna know what this number is here. We're given this number here. This is what's given. We're given the mass units, right? Grams, but we wanna find the number of moles, this one here. So what I'll do is I'll use that as a conversion factor. One mole of carbon is 12.01 grams of carbon. I'll put carbon in both places. And so then the grams of carbon cancel and your unit is moles of carbon. So you just count it up, 12, 24, 48. It's a little bit more than four, 52.10 divided by 12.01, and you get 4.338 moles of carbon, right? And that should make sense. If I had 12 grams, that would be one mole. If I had 24 grams, that would be two moles. 36 would be three moles. 48 would be four. It's a little bit more than 48, so it's a little bit more than four. So really what we're doing is we're just doing a really, that's what's interesting about these problems. It's just a simple conversion factor. It's not really that complicated. Here's an analogy. Suppose I said there's 12 inches equals one foot. And then I said, hey, I measure out a room. And the room is, you know, 65 inches across. How many feet is that? What you would do is you'd say, okay, here's my conversion factor. 
here's the measurement. That's the information that's given. You'd say 65 inches. Okay, that's what's given. I want to convert it to feet. So we put this one in the top. So one foot in the top, and then you put this one in the bottom, 12 inches. And then so really what you're doing is you're taking 65 and you're dividing it by 12. And you get 5.42 or 5.4 feet, right? The inches cancel. So that's really all these problems are, is you're just taking this, this molar mass, you're using it as a conversion factor, and, and, and then that's allowing you to calculate how many moles. If I gave you the number of moles, you could just reverse it, right? So if I, well, we'll look at, we'll look at some examples of that. You just reverse, you know, which one goes in the top and which one goes in the bottom, and that allows you to go to the opposite direction, okay? Now, that's for elements. For molecules, we'll have to add up their atomic masses, but that's simple. We'll do that. So let me show you an example here. So this is one out of Alex. The name of this type of problem is calculating and using the molar mass of elements. So let me write that down so you see it. Calculating and using the molar mass of elements. Remember the elements are those materials that are in the periodic table. Right, like carbon, oxygen, iron. So, so what you do is, uh, the first one is a chemist weighs out 15.5 grams of iron. Oh, you know, you're right, Nicole, I didn't finish that. Let me, um, let me do this one calculation, I'll come back to it. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, so the question here is, how many moles did you did she weigh out? So how many moles did she weigh out? Okay. So iron, right? So be careful. Iron is, is, it's not IR. IR I think is iridium. Um, some of the elements are just like the ancient Latin words. So it's ferrum which is element number 26, um, which sometimes people get Fe confused with fluorine because it starts with an F, but Fe is iron. And it's 55.85, that's your molar mass. So that's the number you want to use down there. That's your molar mass, okay? And that's your conversion factor. Remember, the molar mass is the conversion factor. So I'm going to write it out as 55.85 grams of iron is one mole, so that's one mole of iron, okay? And just to kind of bring it back to Nicole's point about how I forgot to do the second part of that previous question, a mole is also 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, right? So when you look at this conversion factor, it actually has two meanings. It's telling you how many grams is one mole, but it's actually telling you also how many atoms that is because a mole is that number of atoms. So here's what's given, 15.5 grams. I'm gonna use the symbol instead of the name. And then I'm gonna say, okay, we wanna know how many moles, here's our conversion factor. So if we wanna know number of moles, we're gonna put this one in the top, right? You put that one in the top because it will get rid. So that when you do that, you'll have moles as your answer and then the grams are gonna cancel out. Again, I'm putting the symbol for the element. You don't have to put the symbol for the element in here. I do recommend you, when you do these problems, you put the units in so that you can keep track of it. But I'm just putting it in there because sometimes we'll do problems where there's iron, but then we're gonna be asking us about a different element. They might ask us about oxygen. So by putting the symbols in there, that allows me to sort of track what I'm doing, okay? So 15.5 over 55.85 is zero. 0.2775, that's probably, and then your units are moles, right? Grams cancel. Um, so that's moles of iron. It's probably too many sig figs. We only have three here. So if you only have three sig figs, it's a good idea to round it to three sig figs. So, so the third sig fig would be right here. This one's five or greater, so we round it up. 
and that would be your answer there. Okay, let me save this one. And then view all these. Okay. Um, so just to come back to Nicole's point, yeah, I forgot to do this. So how many atoms are in there? So here's how you get from moles to atoms. If you have 4.338 moles of carbon, so we have moles, and we want to get to the number of atoms. That's where you're going to use the conversion factor of what a mole is. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So let me write that down here. One mole of something, in this case it's carbon, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Okay, of carbon, for example. Okay, so what you would do then is you'd say, okay, we're going to use this as our conversion factor. So we would say 4.338 moles. And then we want to know the number of atoms, so we put the number at the top. If you want to know the number, you put the number at the top. And then you put a mole at the bottom. If they gave you the number of atoms and they wanted you to find the moles, you would just do the reverse. Okay, so the moles cancel and then that's going to give you, so that's going to be a pretty big number, right? It's going to be around 10 to the 24th or something like that. 4.338 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And yeah, it's, it's a big number. It's like 2.612 times 10 to the 24 atoms. So thank you, Nicole, for bringing that up. I forgot to do that one. Okay, um, so there's our answer for that part B. So, so the, the mole is kind of cool because it allows you to connect the number of atoms, but it also allows you to connect to grams, right? So let me, um, absolutely. So let me um, save that one again and then come back to, um, or actually let me just review. Okay, come back to this one right here. Here's what, here's what I would recommend kind of thinking about is think of the mole as sort of the center of your conversions. So it's right here in the middle. And the mole can be used to convert into um, number of atoms. Right. So that's what I just did right there. We took the number of moles of carbon and converted it to the number of atoms. And the way we did that was by using that, that, that big number, right? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, again, keep in mind, you can go back the other way too, right? Like you can convert between feet and inches, but you can also convert between inches and feet. So if you're going from the moles to the number of atoms, you multiply by that Avogadro's number. But if you want to go back the other way, you divide, right? You just divide by Avogadro's number, right? And that'll allow you to go from number of atoms to the number of moles. So that's one conversion. And again, to be honest with you, we don't do that conversion in chemistry very often. I mean, if we're doing like, we're really trying to figure out the dynamics of how molecules are behaving, like the physics of molecules, we'll use that number in our calculations. But more likely, more commonly, the day in and day out life of a chemist or a biologist is really about figuring out how much something weighs, right? So like if you're a biologist or a biochemist and you're running a reaction, you're not gonna count the number of atoms. What you're gonna do is you're gonna weigh things out and figure out how many moles there are. That's a much more common type of calculation. So the mole is also calculated to the mass, how much mass something has. So let me write mass over here. And so if you are going from um, mass and mole, if you're going from moles to mass, let's do it that direction. From moles to mass, what you're gonna do is you're going to multiply by the molar mass. And if you're gonna go from mass to moles, you're gonna divide by the molar mass, okay? And so, you know, it's relatively straightforward there. Um, those are the conversions that you do. So let me show you one more kind of um, an Alex problem, sort of with this picture. I'll try to see if I can fit it in here so that you have this little diagram for you. Those are the, the main conversions. So let me 
close that one and open up this one here. Now I'm going to add one more kind of aspect to this, which is to deal with a diatomic element. So this one is called, this type of problem is called calculating. So it's, it's almost the same title, right? Calculating and using the molar mass of diatomic elements. So there's, there's a slight of diatomic elements. There's a slight modification here. Okay. And that's that instead of just saying elements, we're going to deal with the diatomic elements. Okay. So a chemist determines by measurement that 0 0.0700 grams. You'll see small numbers in these measurements because we often measure small amounts of things of iodine in a reaction. So in some chemical reaction, they, they measure out 0 0.0700 grams. Okay. So calculate the mass of iodine in the reaction. Okay, so what they're doing in this problem is they're they're having you do, you know, the same sort of calculation that we just did with iron, but they're throwing it in that it's a diatomic element. And so the way you deal with the diatomic elements, let me re remind you again, the diatomic elements are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Right, those are your diatomic elements. In nature, they exist as dimers, as diatomic elements, meaning there's two atoms together. So if I weigh out some mass of iodine, I'm not weighing out the mass of the individual atoms, I'm weighing out the mass of the molecules. So in this problem, when it says you've got 0 0.0700 grams of iodine, you be careful because since it's a diatomic, it's that many grams of I2, not I, but I2. And I2 is heavier than I, right? Like a bicycle with two tires is heavier than a bicycle with one tire, with one wheel. So I2 weighs twice as much as iodine. So what you gotta do then is you gotta go look up the atomic mass or the molar mass of iodine Iodine is element number 53, and it's, gosh, I think it's 137.3. I think that's what it's a molar mass is. But that's how much I weighs. Since it says iodine, they implicitly mean I2. So for those seven elements, if they say hydrogen, they would mean H2. If they said chlorine, they would mean Cl2. So that means the molar mass isn't 137.3. Actually, I don't think it is 137. I'm sorry. Let me hold, hold on one second here. I want to make sure I got the right molar mass. I think barium is 137. Um, it is 126.9. There we go. 126.9. I got the wrong number here. There we go. There's iodine, 126.9. Okay, so the molar mass, since it's I2, it's two times 126.9, which would be what, 253.8 per one mole. Okay, so that changes the problem. That's why it's called that's why this Alex problem is called calculating and using the molar mass of diatomic elements. For those seven elements, you have, to, you have to double what the molar mass is. Okay. So one mole weighs 253.8. So let's look at let's look at this little diagram here. In the question, they gave us the mass, right? That's mass. Grams is mass. 
So they're giving us this right over here on the left side. And then they're asking us, um, oops, I have another typo here. The moles. A couple typos there. Okay, so calculate the moles of iodine. So they're asking us for this one right here. They're not asking us for the number of atoms or molecules. If they were asking for atoms or molecules, we would be doing this conversion over here on the right. But since it's giving us the mass in grams and asking us for the number of moles, that's this conversion here. So what do we do? We divide by the molar mass. So our molar mass is 253.8. So I'm, I'm running out of room here. So what I'm gonna, I guess what I'll do is I'll just erase this up here because I don't want to create a new slide. There we go. Okay. So let me write the information down here. We've got 0 0.07 grams. And again, it's iodine, it's I2. And then we wanna convert that to moles. So we're gonna divide by the molar mass. So one mole of iodine. So that's what I'm doing is I'm taking this here and putting it up on the top. And then I'm gonna divide it by this one right here. Divide by 253.8 grams of iodine. Okay, so to go from grams to moles, you divide by the molar mass. So 0 0.07 divided by 253.8, and you get, it's going to be really small. So let me write it out. And then your grams are gone and you got moles. Okay. That's so small that generally we want to put it in scientific notation. So how do we do that? I, I tend to remember lip, which means left is positive. So the alternate of the opposite of that would be is that if left is positive, right is negative, right? So in scientific notation, you want the number to be between one and 10. So you move the decimal place one, two, three, four places, right? We're going to the right, so it's gonna be negative. So you move it to where the decimal's between one and nine. So there's a two, so that's between one and nine. So 2.758, and then I moved it four places and I moved it to the right, so it's negative four. And that would be moles of iodine. Okay, so lip, left is positive, right, right is negative, um, or rim, <laughs> um, and that would be your answer right there. So that'd be the number of moles, okay? Um, probably don't, I probably have too many sig figs in there. The, the, the sig fig issue is kind of complicated with zeros. So the, the general rule of thumb is that if you have a decimal point, the zeros at the end count. Right, those are called trailing zeros. So if you have zeros at the end and there is a decimal in the number explicitly shown, then you count the ones at the right. But you never count the ones on the left side, whether there's a decimal point or not, you never count the ones on the left. So that one on the left doesn't count, but the ones on the right do because there's a decimal point in the number. So you have one, two, three sig figs. So we would round this to three sig figs. So one, two, three, the eight is greater than five or five or greater, so you round it up to six. So 2.76 times 10 to the minus four moles of ID. Okay, so that problem actually, in terms of Alex, will have a few things in it that they're getting you at. One is they, I mean, they might allow you to enter it in as a decimal form, I guess. So if that's the case, you don't have to do the scientific notation. Um, but they're probably also going to be very specific about the number of sig figs. So they gave a number that you really have to kind of understand that, oh yeah, leading zeros, the zeros in the front don't count, but the ones in the end do. So if you put in as your answer 2.758, it's probably gonna warn you that that doesn't have the correct number of sig figs. Um, it might actually, I think the way I set it up when I created this course 
was I told it to warn you, to let you, or to actually tell you how many sig figs to report the answer. So it probably in the question should say, report this to three sig figs and, and that'll help you right there. Okay. Let me show you another one that's kind of similar just so that you're clear on this one. Let me close that up. Um, okay. So here's another one. So again, this is a similar problem. It's calculating and using the molar mass. In this one though, they call it a hetero diatomic compound. That's a big word. That's a big fancy word, right? Hetero means different. Diatomic means two atoms. And a compound means different elements. So that in, in that name, you know, don't be scared off by the name. It's such a big name, heterodiatomic element. What that means is hetero means that there's different elements in there. Di means there's two elements in there. And then atomic just means it's atoms. And then compound, you know, heterodiatomic has to be a compound. It can't be an element. So they didn't have to put the word compound in there. That's sort of reinforcing this idea of hetero. Okay. So here's the example. They give you the chem. They, in this in this case, they give you the chemical formula. They tell you it's beryllium oxide, and then they give you the formula BeO. Okay, and then they tell you that seven point twenty six grams of BeO is produced in a reaction. They call it an experiment. Calculate the number of moles. Produced. Okay. So it, you know, it even though um, it's BEO and it's not I2 or FE, it's really the same problem we just did. They're giving you the mass and they're asking you to find the number of moles. So again, I'm not going to write the full thing out. I'll just put moles here in the center, or actually here it'll be on the right, and then over here mass. And so remember what we said was that if you're going from moles to mass, you're going to multiply by the molar mass. And if you're going from mass to moles, you're going to divide by the molar mass. Okay. So if you take a look, what are they telling you? They're giving you the mass, right? The fact that they give you G there, that means grams, that's the mass. And they're asking you for the number of moles. So that's this direction here, right? We're going from mass to moles. So you're just going to divide by the molar mass. That's all you got to do. But here's the issue. This substance has two different elements in it. It has beryllium, which is element number four. And it has oxygen in it, which is element number eight. Okay, each of those elements has a weight. Each of them has a, a molar mass. So we need to know what the molar mass of the whole thing is, beryllium oxide, not just the mass of how much the molar mass of beryllium or of oxygen. So we're going to look up, I'm just going to look up molar mass of beryllium. Beryllium is 9.01. That's right, because boron is 10.81. So it's a little bit less than that. And then oxygen is 16.00. Okay. So here's how we calculate the molar mass of BEO. You just add them together. You say, look, there's one beryllium, right? Beryllium is 9.01. And there's one ox, right? One beryllium, one oxygen. Oxygen is 16.00. So that gets you 25.01. So I'm going to write it this way. One mole of BEO is 
0.01 grams of BEO, right? So I've written out the molar mass in this form right here. Okay, just add up the molar mass of each atom, of each element, put them together. Okay, um, if it were BE2O, you would take two beryllium's and one oxygen. If it were BEO2, you would take one beryllium and two oxygens. Okay, so now 7.26 grams of BEO. And I'm going to use this conversion factor. What did we say? We said divide it, right? Let me show that that works out. Dividing, what we mean by dividing is you're going to put the gram unit in the bottom, in the denominator. And so your grams of BEO will cancel and you'll be left with moles of BEO. So when, you, when you're converting to moles, the number gets smaller because you're always dividing by some number that's one or greater. So, so grams to moles will give you a smaller number. Moles to grams will give you a bigger number. So 7.26 over 25.01 is 0 0.29. I guess there's only three sig figs, so 290 moles of BEO. And there's your answer. Okay. And you know, sometimes people will do it this way. What they'll do is they'll say, look, divide by molar mass. So 7.26 grams divided by 25.01 grams per mole. Grams cancel, and you end up with units that are one divided by one divided by moles, which is the same as moles, and you get 0 0.290 moles of BEO. So either technique will, use, will work if you just want to remember to divide it by it. The units actually do work out, or you can use the formal dimensional analysis, and that will kind of show you more clearly how the units work out such that you get the right answer. Generally, we do prefer people to do it this way right here, because in the next section, we'll start doing problems where there's multiple steps. And so by kind of laying it out step by step, it, it, it's more useful to use this method up here. Um, but some people prefer to do it this way. They just divide it by, okay? Just be careful with your units. Okay, let's see here. think, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that's pretty much it for the molar mass calculations that you have to do. So let me talk a little bit then about mole ratios. So we're going to talk about finding mole ratios from chemical formulas. Formula is actually a Latin word, so the plural is not formulas, it's formulae. Okay. So let's take a look there. Let me come back over here. Good. Okay. All right, so in this particular problem, what we're interested now in now is looking at a chemical formula. So here's one right here. And I talked a little bit about this yesterday. There's different ways to represent chemical compounds. This is the way that the Alex, this particular problem in Alex is showing you to do acetic acid. And here's what they do in this problem. They say that in a measurement, there's 0 0.080 moles of carbon. In a sample of vinegar or in a sample of acetic acid. And what they want you to do is to calculate or find the number of moles of oxygen and of hydrogen in the sample. 
Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not that not that difficult. Really, what we're doing here is we're just sort of counting wheels on a, a, a vehicle. So a bicycle has two wheels. A um, an automobile has four wheels, right? So we're really just kind of doing that. So here's how you go about it. In this particular compound, let's count up the number of carbon atoms, the number of hydrogen atoms, and the number of oxygen. The carbon, there's one right here, and then there's another one right there. So there's two carbons. The number of hydrogens, you've got three right there, right, H3. And then you've got another H at the end, so that's one right there. So you got four. And then the oxygen is right here. It just says two. So you got two oxygens. So um, don't be thrown off by the terminology here, moles. It's the same ratio in moles as it would be for the number of atoms. So for example, if I said that the sample had, let's say, um, I don't know, 50 carbon atoms. The number of hydrogen atoms is four to two is the ratio, right? So it's four hydrogen atoms for every two carbon atoms. This is the, that's the ratio, right? Every time you have two carbons, you have four hydrogens. Okay. The same is true for moles because a mole is just six times 10 to the 23rd. So it's also true that four moles of hydrogen that the ratio is four moles of hydrogen for every two moles of carbon. The ratio in atoms is the same ratio as, as, the, as moles. So when they give you moles, you can just use those ratios. Now, there's also a ratio between carbon and oxygen. So it looks like it's two to two, right? There's two, I'll use oxygen on the top, two oxygen atoms for every two carbon atoms but the mole ratio is the same. Two moles of oxygen for every two moles of carbon, okay? So now we can solve this problem. You've got 0.08 moles of carbon in the sample. So really what they're doing is they're saying, look, you got this sample in here. It's like, you know, acetic acid is a liquid. So you've got this liquid inside of a container and there's 0.08 moles of carbon in you know carbon in that sample in that container so how many moles of the other materials do you have well you're just going to use these mole ratios here so if you want to know how much hydrogen there is sorry let me write this again You just say, okay, it's four moles of hydrogen for every two moles of carbon. And that would give you 0.160 moles of hydrogen, right? You get twice as much, right? So, you know, there's, there's four of these for every two of those, so you have twice as much. The same is, well, not the same, but you also can use this ratio here. It's two oxygens for every two carbons. So what's gonna happen there is it's two moles of oxygen for every two moles, oops, sorry, I'm running out of room here, two moles of carbon. Well, two divided by two is just one, so it's gonna be the same number. And so what this does is this leads you, oops, this leads you, let's see eraser. It leads you into an analysis of this compound. We can now say this sample has 0 0.080 moles of carbon. It has 0 0.160 moles of hydrogen. And it has 0 0.08 moles of oxygen. So we've now kind of analyzed this compound by using these molar ratios. We figured out from one, from knowing one of them, which was the carbon, to now knowing all three elements just by using those ratios. Okay. And there you go. So that's molar ratios. That leads us, the reason they put that in there is that leads us up to another topic that's going to come up.
And just, you know, before I move on to the next problem, I just want to talk a little bit, just a moment about acetic acid. So you'll notice how they put the H out there on the right side. Let me show you what the structural formula is. Acetic acid is actually the compound you're going to study in, I think it's your third lab. Okay, so this is acetic acid. And, and chemists have multiple ways of representing structures. So this is one way we could re represent acetic acid. Another way would be like this. We're actually showing the connections between the atoms in the, in the molecule. And it could also be shown this way. It could also be this hydrogen could be thrown out to the front and the carbons put together. Okay, so that's another way of showing it. And typically this way is done when we want to represent that it's an acid. Biologists will actually do it this way. Biologists often represent acetic acid this way. They actually prefer to show the COOH on the right side. So, so, so in, the, in a sense, it doesn't really matter. If we were to give you any of these formulas, you could still do that problem, right? Because all you have to do is count them up. There's two carbons, there's four hydrogens, and there's two oxygens. So e any of these ways will give you the same answer, but I just wanted to point out that there are different ways. So when you look at these problems, you may see the same molecule represented in different ways. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna show you, it looks like we have, we have about eight minutes. So I'm gonna show you one more type of problem here. So this is finding, it's like a little puzzle problem. Finding the chemical formula, formulae, from a mole ratio. Okay, so in this one, they give you an unknown compound. So they say C2FX. So unknown meaning we don't know what X is. We wanna find out what X is. But we're gonna point out that X has to be a whole number. Okay, so that means it's going to be one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight. Um, if it's a one, we just don't write it. We just write F, but it's, it's some number between one and eight or nine or 10. Okay, and then it says that they do these measurements. So we're going to make some measurements, and here's what they figure out from these measurements that the compound has 5.2 moles of fluorine and 1.74 moles of carbon, okay? So that's the information they give you. And, and this information, we wanna use it to figure out what that X is. Okay, so here's here's one approach. I'm just going to give you one approach. And remember, all the Alex problems in, in these homework, they have their own explanations. Sometimes the explanations are pretty good. Sometimes they're a little awkward. Sometimes they're a little complicated and involved. Um, but it's good for one that you're, you know, having any kind of problems with to read their explanation to see if you can kind of make sense of how they're going about it. You may find on occasion they're doing it a little different than I am. So let's take a look at this. Um, what they're doing is they're telling us how much of each element there is in the compound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a ratio. I'm going to take the one that's larger. I'm going to take the larger value divided by the smaller value. Now, you could do the smaller divided by the larger. That'd be perfectly fine. But 
I find it's easier if you do the larger divided by the smaller. So the larger one is the fluorine. So it's 5.2 moles of fluorine per 1.74 moles of carbon. And I'm going to see what that comes out to. 5.2 divided by 1.74. And I get 2.99. So what that's telling me is that for every mole of carbon, you have 2.99 times as much fluorine. Fluorine's on the top. That ratio is really close to three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna round it to three. And what that tells me is that you have three moles of fluorine for every one mole of carbon, All right? That's what that ratio is telling you. And so what you would do then is you say, okay, if it's a ratio of three to one and I have two carbons, so times two moles of carbon, that gives you six moles of fluorine, right? It's three to one. So if you have two carbons, you gotta have six fluorines. And that number right there would be our answer that we would want to put in there, okay? See how that number, that's a ratio of six to two. Six to two is the same ratio as three to one, right? So what you're doing is you're saying, you know, figuring out, oh, based on our data, what that ratio is. Now I rounded it to three because we know these have to be whole numbers. So I got to round that up to a whole number. But given that information, that would tell us three times two is six. So the fluorine has to be six, okay? Let's try one more. Got just a couple minutes. So I think there's enough time to do one more. Now that one's exactly the same problem. Let me see if I can find one that's a little different. Okay, here's one. So in this one, They, they tell us the formula is MgXCl2. So again, we're trying to figure out what X is. And again, it's gotta be a whole number. And then they tell us the measurements are 1.2 moles of magnesium. So this is information about the compound and 2.31 moles of chlorine. Okay, so again, what I would do is take the larger one, so 2.31 moles of chlorine, and divide that by the smaller. And I would label which element it is so that you know which one you're talking about. Now that is going to be a little bit less than two, but what we can go ahead and round it to two again. I mean, yeah, round it to two. It's 1.925. That's pretty close to two. And so what that means is you've got two moles of chlorine for every one mole of magnesium, right? Two to one is the same ratio as 2.31 to 1.2, okay? So now you come back over here and you say, okay, well, we know what chlorine is. We wanna know what magnesium is. So we know we have two moles of chlorine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, two moles of chlorine, and we want to know magnesium. So I'll put magnesium on the top. One mole of magnesium for every two moles of chlorine. Well, that gives you one mole, right? One mole of magnesium. Because it was two and one, right? So if this is a two, that's got to be a one. So just be careful when you write the formula Generally, we don't put a one in the formula. You get rid of the one. So change it to, oops, change it to just MgCl2, right? One magnesium, two chlorines, and there you go, okay? So that's, um, again, that one is sort of a building problem. What they're doing with that problem is they're trying to get us used to this idea of ratios so that in the more advanced problems in the chapter, we'll be able to do ratios really well, okay? So they're giving you two numbers to build a ratio. That ratio there 
has to be the same ratio here because this is the same compound as the one that they analyzed. That's what a compound is. It's a specific ratio of, of elements in, in the substance, okay? Very good. So um, on Monday, we'll keep going on this chapter three. Try to do as much of the chapter three problems as you can. You got some, you know, I think next Friday, you got a deadline. So you still have some time, still a little over a week, but you don't wanna, again, chapter three has the most topics in your homework. It has the most types of problems. So um, you really want to put a lot of effort in this next week to get that one done. And then over time, the number of topics is a little bit smaller, but the problems get a little harder. So some of these are pretty easy, but there's a lot of them. So knock a few out each day, okay? Reach out to me if you have any questions um, and I will post this within the next hour or so, hour to two hours um, onto YouTube and um, have a great end of the week and a great weekend, you guys. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.